Today I'd like to talk about discovering latent structure in deep robotic learning. Um, I'm a research scientist at Google Brain, and um, this work has been done in collaboration with uh, wonderful colleagues at DeepMind and University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where I did my PhD. So actually the title of the talk um, should be more about discovering, multi, uh, discovering latent structure in multitask deep robotic learning. And I really want to emphasize the multitask aspect of it. Uh, because I think this is, this is crucial for, for this line of work, and um, I would like to tell you why that is the case. Um, so, first of all, um, I think solving, being able to solve multiple tasks is very important just from the, from the perspective of doing something useful and learning something useful. So, I think the, the reason why we are so impressive um, in terms of learning new skills, it's not because we can master one particular skill really well, but because we can learn many different skills and we can adapt to new skills very quickly. Um, so this kind of stays in, in stark contrast to model-free reinforcement learning methods that kind of focus on one particular task and then you are given some amount of time and compute and you need to master that one particular task. I think it's much more impressive and it's much more useful for practical application to be able to learn multiple tasks at the same time and learn representations that will be able to transfer between different tasks and allow us to adapt to new tasks quicker. So I think this is a more interesting problem. The other thing is that if we want to look at the structure and learn different uh, and learn the right structure, that, um, I think we can. It's much easier to to be done when we work on multiple tasks. And the reason is rather simple. So, for example, if I try to answer the question, um, let's say, where does perception end and policy start? It's very hard to make this distinction when we are looking only on one particular task. However, if we have this multi-view um, example where we can look at multiple multiple tasks and kind of see from see um, these solutions from different perspectives, I think it, it's much easier to discover the, the latent structure and then use it to our advantage later. And then one other question that, that we can ask, which I think is a, it's a very valid question, is you know, if, if we want to learn all kinds of different tasks, why can't we just use deep reinforcement learning? It's a really good tool that we have in our repertoire and basically learn a policy for every single task and leave it at that. And I think it's a valid question. It's kind of an equivalent of having a hammer, which is our deep reinforcement learning hammer, and just looking for nails and kind of nail every single one of them. Um, but in practice, and having worked with these methods, I think that our hammer looks more, more like this. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's very tricky to solve every single task that there is, especially in robotics. And um, right now, these methods are very fragile, and we don't really know how to get them to work on the scale that we would like to. So I think multitask reinforcement learning could be a way to, to, to tackle these problems. And um, in today's talk, I would like to introduce this little categorization that I thought of in terms of different types of how we as humans learn and also show you examples of state-of-the-art in robotics in all of these three categories. So the first category is very standard, is learning for trial and error. So this is the, the classic paradigm of reinforcement learning itself. Um, so it's rather a simple setup where you start in a certain state, you're in an episodic learning setting, and uh, you perform a set of rollouts, and then you get rewards at the end of them, and then you're trying to find a policy that will maximize the sum of these rewards. And you do it iteratively, and over some period of time, you'll be able to learn the policy that will do reasonably well in this environment. And you kind of assume that you can reset to the same state every single time. So this is the simple trial and error category. There's also another type of learning, imitation learning, where uh, rather than learning on our own through trial and error, we are trying to observe other agents or we are given some demonstrations and then from that we try to extrapolate how we can learn to do the exact same skill that was presented to us. And then there's also a third kind of learning which I think um, hasn't been addressed as much as the other two, which is learning from prior experience. And this is something that we as humans do a lot uh, when we learn how to adapt to, to new situations where we kind of can start from something that we already know how to do and just kind of um, fine-tune it a little bit and then find the, the right policy or, or the right way to accomplish something new. And I think we don't do this enough in, in deep reinforcement learning and especially in robotics. So the, here we try to answer questions, you know, how can we learn skills such that they're easily reusable and so that we can kind of borrow from our past experiences. So let's take a look at these three categories and compare where we are 
when, how good we are as, as humans in terms of all three of them and what's the state of the art in robotics. So um, actually before I get to this, uh, I, I'm not really sure about the crowd here. So if you could just tell me if you guys are more or less familiar with reinforcement learning. So if people are familiar with reinforcement learning, could you raise your hand please? Okay, great. So pretty much almost everybody, okay. Um, great, so um, in terms of trial and error, so in terms of humans, this is one particular example that I think it's a, it's kind of very reinforcement learning specific example where we have a person that is trying to learn how to do a backflip. Uh, it takes him approximately five hours or so, so it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, it's a very MDP-like setup where the, the agent resets himself to the same state every single time. So he kind of goes in, in front of the mattress every time. It, he gets frustrated like midway through the video very much. You will be able to see that. Um, and then tries to perform it over and over again. Um, and the thing is that you know this is this is quite complicated skill. I don't know if any of you have tried doing backflip, but it's a very tricky skill to learn. Uh, but it's still he can still do it quite efficiently within five hours or so. Um, but also one one thing to pay attention here is uh, that um, he's able to explore in this environment such that he doesn't injure himself. Uh, in this case, he also put the mattress and so on, but he kind of has this little ability of landing such that he doesn't you know, break his arm or something like that. So um, one question we can ask is, you know, can we do something like this with robots? And the simple answer could be, yes, we can. Here is a robot doing a backflip. And this is a very impressive video from Boston Dynamics. Uh, the caveat here is, though, that uh, there's no learning being applied in this video. So everything that you see is really good optimal uh, control theory. Um, and the robot is able to do this, but it's also many, many years of really good engineering and fine tuning and finding the right parameters for all of these controllers um, so that the robot can do this backflip. So this is kind of like a one-off demo that is still very impressive. Um, but now if we were to learn it in an agile way, way the same way that we as humans do, um, it's not clear if it would be possible or not, but sometime in the middle of the process, it might look something like this. Um, so there's many questions that we still need to answer in this in this very simple regime, uh, such as you know how to explore safely, how can we make it very sample efficient, and and so on. But this is not to say that we didn't make a lot of progress in this area. So in pure reinforcement learning, I would even argue that this is the area where in the past four or so years, we've made the most progress. Um, so now we can have a, we have a computer being able to beat a human champion at Go. This is using deep reinforcement learning techniques. We also have examples of these being applied to, of, of these techniques being applied to robotics. So here is an example from um, Google Brain, um, where we have seven KUKA robots that were um, collecting experiences over, I think, around a month of time. Uh, running basically 24/7, learning how to grasp objects from a bin, and uh, you know it took a really long time to collect all of these experiences. We wasted a lot of compute in the meantime, but eventually we were able to solve the task of grasping to an extent where we can grasp more or less any object from a bin uh, at approximately I think 96 or 98 uh, percent success rate. So this shows that it is possible, and this is done directly from vision. So it shows that um, it is possible to learn some skills in, in a physical world uh, that can be applied on real robots. However, it takes really long time, um, and it's kind of also just one particular skill that we're able to learn. And there's been also some advancements in terms of um, the data efficiency and the sample complexity of these methods. So here is one example of our work at USC, uh, where we could have this, this PR2 robot learn how to play hockey, or in this case, just how to hit this puck in the goal um, with a deep neural network policy uh, that was learned very efficiently, so it took around 40 minutes um, real time to, to learn this skill. Uh, so there's clearly some advancements here. Um, so this is something that I would not like to focus on today. So this is just to give you like a little bit of background. So let's look at imitation learning. So I think this is an area where we as humans are particularly impressive. Um, so here's a little example of a baby being able to imitate uh, Rocky Balboa, I think, in this case. Um, and what's particularly impressive is that this baby is looking at a 2D screen, at a bunch of pixels. Um, it's looking at an agent that looks very different to, to the baby itself. 
Uh, it's, he has a different morphology. Also, he's super muscular and amazing. We all watched Rocky. Um, and it's able to find a mapping between the morphology of this agent on a 2D screen and its own morphology and imitate every single skill more or less perfectly. Uh, not only that, but it's also able to kind of realize when the skill is switching and that there are many different skills and have to imitate every single one. Uh, if we were to compare it to state-of-the-art in robotics, let's say like three years ago or so, um, it would look very different. So here is um, a postdoc from our lab, Oliver Kramer. Uh, he's now a professor at CMU, uh, who's showing a demonstration to a robot, uh, which is kind of the, 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 the main way that how we used to provide demonstrations for imitation learning. Uh, the other name of this field is also learning from demonstration. Uh, so basically, you would show only one particular skill. In this case, you would just drag robot's arm. Uh, it's what we called kinesthetic teaching. And basically present exactly the skill that you want the robot to replicate, even by using its own joints. So the problem is very much simplified. Not only the, the medium that we are using is very mu much simpler, but also is just an example of one particular skill. Now, um, over the past three, four years or so, uh, we've done, um, we've made amazing progress in, in, in this field as well, um, especially in terms of the way we provide these demonstrations. So here is one example. This is a work from, from Chelsea Finn, who's also at Google Brain now, uh, that shows how we can learn from uh, just one demonstration. Um, this is assuming that you pre-trained all of this using meta-learning. But at test time, you provide one video demonstration of a human performing a task and then the robot can replicate this task. So in this case, the human is either pushing um, one object to, towards the other, or I think dropping a ball, um, and then the robot, even if it's in a slightly different setup, can realize what is the task that you're trying to provide to the robot and, and replicate it more or less okay. Um, one thing to, to, to realize here is that we made a lot of progress in terms of the fact that we can now provide video demonstrations and kind of make sense out of it but it's still a demonstration on one, of one particular skill that we want the robot to replicate. So, so one question that we would like to focus on is how can we provide just, let's say, a YouTube video where there's many different skills and there's, you know, let's say, a baby playing with its toys and it's doing all kinds of different things. And uh, so a video like this would contain a lot of noise, but it also contains a lot of useful skills. Um, so how can we extract the useful skills and how can we learn the policies that would imitate all of them? So I'll be talking about this today. Um, but before that, let's focus on the, on the third part, which I think hasn't received as much love as the other two. Um, so learning from prior experience. And this is what we do, I would argue, all the time. Here's one particular example of where it comes to a fault. So here's a little baby that was trained on or exposed to an iPad. So it does the sweep motions and zooming in and so on, and then tries to use the same motion on the magazine and it, and it doesn't work. Um, but um, I would argue that in robotics, we don't do it nearly enough. And I think there should be an, a really big emphasis shift on, on these kind of tasks. Uh, one particular example that tries to address it is meta-learning. So here is um, a video from uh, model adaptive meta-learning, also known as MAML work, where uh, we pre-train these networks in a certain way, such that um, at test time, we can provide a, a demonstration of a new task or um, for example, we can just do a few rollouts of the new task, and then by taking just a few gradient steps, we can adjust our policy very quickly to this new situation. So this is one particular way of addressing this. All right, so um, in today's talk, I won't be focusing on pure reinforcement learning, but rather on the remaining two, on the advancements that we've made in imitation learning and learning from prior experience. And uh, in particular, we have quite a lot of time. Um, so I would like to take a little break after the first part of the lecture. Uh, we'll take like a 10 minutes break or so. Um, all right, so let's start with, with imitation. All right, so um, just to set the scene again, um, we want to move away from this very constrained demonstration where we drag the robot's arm, but not only this, we only provide a demonstration of one particular skill that we want the robot to replicate perfectly, and we want to move to this much more unstructured environment where we could have a baby playing with its toys, and while it's doing lots of random things, 
we can also, it's also doing a lot of useful things, such as grasping an object, stacking objects, you know, putting an object into a hull, all kinds of different things, putting objects in, their, in, in its mouth, you know, arguably. Um, and we would like to first segment all of these demonstrations, so kind of make sense, extract the ones that, that make sense, and then learn a policy that would be able to replicate all of them. All right, so in order to do this, we'll be basing our, our method on generative adversary imitation learning. Um, so I'll quickly introduce how this method works. Um, if you're familiar with it, it might be a little bit boring, but uh, I think it's, it's important for everybody to understand, and it's a very simple idea. So it's based on generative adversarial network scans, uh, but applied to imitation learning. So the way it works is that we have some expert, so this is somebody that uh, gives us the, the, the demonstrations, and let's say expert um, acts according to this policy pi of E1. So the expert would provide some kind of state action pairs, uh, which are D demonstrations, um, and let's say this is, these are just demonstrations of one particular task. So this is the um, original Gale setup. So let's just assume that these look like this. So these are these blue circles. And then we will also have a robot, so our policy that we're trying to learn. And the robot is trying to learn a policy pi of theta. Um, that is, gives you a distribution of our actions given a state. Um, so it performs some, some actions according to, to its own policy. In this case, these are the, the red circles, and they both need to interact in the environment. So now what we can do, we can train on the discriminator. So take all of, the, all of the state action pairs that we get from expert and from the robot. We know for each state action pair where it came from. So we know if it was the robot that performed it or we got it from, from our demonstration. And then we can train a discriminator through supervised learning that given a state action pair will be able to tell us if it came from a robot or from, uh, from the demonstrator. Now to, to close this loop entirely, we also need to provide the reward to, to our policy, to our, our rel agent. Um, so in this case, this is, this is the adversarial report. Uh, we, we give the reward to, to the policy every time it is able to fool the discriminator. So basically, if you can produce a state action pair that um, is indistinguishable from the state action pair that, we, that we've seen in the demonstration, then you get a reward. So, so that means that um, our policy needs to be able to replicate the state action pairs more or less perfectly, uh, and it learns it over the, through, through the interaction of the real world so that the discriminator is constantly being fooled and then we, we basically accomplished what we, what we wanted. Right, so this is the original setup. Um, by the way, if there is something that is unclear, please, we have a lot of time, so please just interrupt me, um, ask questions, it's, it's totally fine. I can repeat the question for the video. Okay, so uh, here uh, you said the discriminator takes a, takes a state action pair. Uh, is it necessary or is it possible for it to take just state and output a distribution over actions? Right, yeah, so, so the discriminator just outputs the, uh, the probability of it coming from the robot or from, um, or from the, the demonstrator, so it doesn't output the actions, just, just to be clear on that part. But yes, it is possible. Um, the, mathematically, it's, it doesn't show up as nicely, but I think uh, there's been some work, um, I think from DeepMind showing that it's totally possible. Yeah, so basically, if you're able to fool the discriminator that is only being exposed to the states, that means that you must have produced the right actions that, that lead to these states. Yeah, so it's okay. definitely possible. Hmm? All right, so um, this approach is, is called, the, the, the acronym is called GALE, so I'll be referring to this quite a bit. And um, in this paper from Ho and Ramon uh, from Stanford, they were able to show that this corresponds to a maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning problem. Um, and this inverse reinforcement learning problem is a big class of, of problems where you're trying to find the reward function um, that describes the demonstration really well. So we don't really have to dive into the details there, uh, but the basic idea is that uh, you're trying to find a reward function such that um, it will give a, a very big reward to um, the, 
to the to the policy that comes from the demonstrator and very small reward to, to, to every other policy that is also regularized by the entropy. And in particular, they, sh they showed that it's possible to, to achieve this objective by uh, formulating it as a GAN, where you're doing this adverse cell setup that I just described, where you basically have a discriminator that is being trained in a supervised fashion, and then you have an agent that is trying to fool this discriminator, plus you have an additional entropy bonus for your policy. All right, uh, and this has been shown in, in this work from Chelsea and, and Christiana. All right, so um, now we would like to extend this, and we would like to extend this to the point where we can not only have demonstration of one particular skill, so not just blue circles that we had before, but all kinds of different things. So let's say we have circles, squares, triangles, and all kinds of different skills, and these are kind of all mixed together. So we have this blob of demonstrations. There is some noise in that, um, as well as many different skills. And from these, we would like to kind of make sense. So first extract the demonstrations that, that are reproducible, and then learn a policy that is able to reproduce every single one of them. Right, so we, we kind of stay in this setup. So we still train a discriminator that is uh, given a state action pair, or just a state that is able to tell us if it came from the robot or from the demonstrator. Uh, but in addition to this, we also need to introduce an additional variable. So this is a random variable that I refer to as intention. Uh, that we sample from at the beginning of the rollout. So this could be a uniform variable um, that we'll sample from that will kind of decide what kind of skill we want to do. So we sample from that, then we condition our policy on the intention as well. And now we need to make sure that this policy doesn't ignore that intention. Right? So now it's conditioned on the state and the intention. And, and one thing we need to make sure of is that this intention has a big control over the policy, over what the robot is able to do. So uh, in particular, what we want to achieve is that if you set this intention, let's say, to, to zero, you will perform one kind, of, one kind of task that you extracted from these demonstrations, let's say grasping. If you um, condition it on, let's say, two, you would perform another skill. So, so this is the basic set of how we modulate the, the policy. Uh, but then we also need to enforce the fact that we can't ignore this, this i, this, this intention variable. And to do this, we introduce an additional network that kind of works similarly to the discriminator, but slightly different. We call it the intention network, which given a state action pair, is trying to predict which intention it came from. Right? So basically the equivalent of the discriminator, but now it's we are regressing towards the intention. Um, so this is also trained with a supervised learning, but this is also added to the reward. So what that means is that the, the policy itself doesn't have control over these weights. So the only way it can help this network with performing its job, with, with doing its job, is to produce such state action pairs uh, for different intentions that are very easily distinguishable. So basically, or in the other, in, in other way, if for every intention you would be performing exact same thing, so basically you would be ignoring intention, then this network have no, has no idea or has no chance of figuring out, given a state action pair, which intention came from. Because for every intention you do exact same thing. So the only way you can help this network is to produce very different state action pairs for different intentions. Right, so, so this is the basic setup. This is the, the slight modification to the algorithm that makes it quite, quite more general, uh, quite a bit more general. So um, in this case, this results in adding one additional term to the max entropy inverse RL objective where uh, we don't only want to maximize the entropy of the policy, um, the marginal policy that doesn't have access to the intention, but we also want to minimize the entropy of the policy that is conditioned on the intention, which basically means that I want you to be very general if I don't tell you what to do. So I want you to kind of cover all kinds of different solutions. But as soon as I tell you what to do, as soon as I give you my intention, I want you to know exactly what to do. All right, and uh, we, we don't have to go through the, through the exact derivation, but basically if you take this term and uh, do a little bit algebra on it, uh, a little bit of calculus, you arrive at this modified Gale objective, which looks exactly the same as before, except we have these two additional terms. We have the entropy of our distribution that we draw the, the intention variable from, and this could be constant, so this is not really, we can just throw it out and forget about it. But then we also have this term um, that basically makes sure that we maximize the probability of the intention, the log probability of the intention given state action. So that corresponds to the fact that our policy is trying to optimize, trying to help this network as much as possible. Um, 
Yes? Yeah. No, they are trained jointly. Yeah, that's a good question. So supervised lazy, it's the same how it works in a, in a simple Gale setup. So the discriminator is constantly trained on every pair. So it's being updated. And while it's being updated, the policy is being adjusted as well. No, so we can only take the, so they're not labeled. Uh, we only take the intentions, the label from the intention that we set. We don't have the intention of the expert. So basically, you can only train it on the data, on the state action pairs that you got from your policy. Right. So you get the so because you set the the intention when you do a rollout, right? So you can you can only take state action pairs from your policy for the intention network. And there you know because you set it yourself, right? You sample from the from the uniform distribution, if you will. You know what, what sample you took, and this is now your label for the intention network. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And there's also a, a paper that, that came around at the same time called InfoGale, also from the group at Stanford, where it shows application of this method to um, trying to um, recognize different driving driving styles in autonomous driving scenario. And there's also possible uh, to derive this entire thing slightly differently um, using um, the formulation that comes from maximizing the mutual information between the intention and say, state action. And this is similar to the InfoGAN approach. Right. Okay, that's a good question. So if I understand correctly, what, what you're saying is, do we need to make sure that, for example, the number of categories here is the same as the number of things that we hope that the expert was trying to show? So the answer is yes and no. If, if, you, if you do know this, it, it will be an easier problem to learn. However, what we've tried in our experiment is setting the number of categories to a very large number. And then basically you, the, the algorithm will try to figure out what's the right kind of clustering of these. So then you would have, for example, if you have 100 intentions, then the intentions from 1 to 30 would correspond to one skill. If you had three skills in your expert uh, demonstrations, from 30 to 60 would be another one, and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question, yeah. So um, technically, you can condition this network on whatever you like. So it could be a trajectory snippet or the entire trajectory. And depending on what you condition it on, the solutions will be differently, right? So if you condition it only on the current state and action pair, that means that given a state action pair, you should be able to figure out what the intention came from. So the skills have to be so much different, right? If you condition it on a snippet, then you know, like two snippets can be fairly similar, but if there's even one, at, at some point that they, they differ and then the, 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 the intention network is able to figure it out, then you're also okay. So it kind of depends on the application. Yeah? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Right, I see. Yeah, um, yes. So basically, you're now. So it has to be. It has to be doing different things. Uh, just to be clear, it's not only based on the action, but also on the state, right? But um, so it needs to be doing different things, and sometimes it might be doing something awkward, right? Just just because it's trying to maximize this this reward. But uh, also uh, make sure that that we realize that we also have the discriminator that is also driving the the, the reward, such that you have to be close to the to the, the demonstrations. So you can't be doing something completely weird that will just result in you maximizing the reward of the intention network because you still have to stay close to what the demonstrator showed you. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be uniform. So you could also learn that. In this case, it's, it's just uniform. Yeah, so, so you, ch you have a full choice of what kind of distribution you'd like to choose here. So it could be a continuous distribution, it could be a discrete distribution, you decide you know, how many categories there are, but it's still a uniform distribution. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is a similar question to what what was asked before there. Uh, so basically, what would happen in this case? It's a harder problem to learn. But uh, what what happened in in our experiments is that if you set this number to much higher than what is present in the data set, then basically it will cluster them together. So you will have a bunch of intentions that are responsible for one kind of skill, some other another group of intentions that is responsible for another one, and so on. Right, so um, to show some experiments of, of how this works, um, this is, these are simple Mujoka experiments to kind of get the idea across, where um, the way it works is that we will train first our, our experts, so we have some experts' trajectories. In this case, they're also trained using reinforcement learning, and these will be um, demonstrations of three different skills. One will be running forwards, running backwards, and then jumping. Um, so we have these demonstrations, then we'll kind of mix them all together, uh, add some noise to it. So at this point, we have this blob of demonstrations. And from that, we would like to replicate, so first find out there are three of them, and then replicate every single one of them. Right? So we kind of synthesize this, this data set so that we have a ground truth for it. All right, so these are the, these are the three trajectories, or three policies that we use as the expert trajectories, running forwards, backwards, and jumping. And then we train this entire thing, and then we condition our um, imitation learning network on different intentions. So when condition on intention zero, we run forwards. When condition on intention one, we're able to find the skill of running backwards. And when condition on intention two, we were able to find the skill of jumping and replicate that skill. So we can, we can get very similar rewards to the expert rewards. We also tried it on much more complex setup. So this is 64 dimensional humanoid. Also three trajectories, forwards, backwards, and jumping. Um, with intention zero, we were able to run forward. With intention one, we were able to discover the skill of running backwards, but we weren't able to learn it as, as accurately as the demonstrations. And with intention two, we have this low kind of standing still behavior. So there's also one other thing that we could apply it to, which is more kind of hierarchical setup, where um, we can still provide two different demonstrations, and one is, um, I don't know if you can see it well here, um, but one is that we have a gripper and we have to grasp this, this little object, this gray box, and the other one starts when the box is already inside the gripper and you have to push the box towards the, uh, towards the red object. So we have these two sets of demonstrations. So they look something like this. I'm, I'm not sure if this is well visible. Um, we, again, kind of mix them all together, so it kind of looks at like one continuous demonstration and we add noise to it, and from these two we can have intention, we, can, we are able to learn a policy that when condition on intention zero, it grasps the object, and then we can manually switch this or learn another policy on top of that, which when, when you grasp the object, we can switch to, in, to, the, to another intention, and then we can bring that object to the goal. So this is kind of more hierarchical setup. Um, all right, so this is one method of how we can discover a little bit more structure in demonstrations and how we can use that to our advantage so that we can um, extract something from these unstructured demonstrations and then learn policies that do many different things. Um, but there's also lots of other works that are kind of in a similar vein. So because this is more kind of a, of a lecture, I would like to introduce some, I think, two of them. That, that This is, just to be clear, this is not my work, but I find this work really interesting. Um, so the first work I, I would like to talk about is the task embedded uh, control networks. This is work from Stephen James from Imperial College London, um, which has this idea of uh, embedding a demonstration such that you, given one demonstration, you can very quickly learn uh, this task that was demonstrated to you. So the way it works is as follows. First, we will be learning an embedding space um, where demonstrations of similar tasks will be cluster close together. So we'll be using some ideas from metric learning to do that. And then we'll also use behavioral cloning to be able to just replicate these policies. 
So in particular, the, the structure of these networks, the way it works is that we have some demonstrations. So these are, these are some frames from the demonstrations. These go through the task embedding network that maps it to some vectors. These vectors are mapped to so-called sentences. So this is where we do the, the metric learning on. And now we, the, the loss that we have here is that we want the demonstrations of the same tasks to lie very close to each other in this embedding space and demonstrations of different tasks to be at least a margin apart. And then once we have these sentences, we can, we can grab a particular sentence, condition our policy on it, uh, feed also our current demonstration to that policy, and then train a control network, so our policy, to, uh, in this case, it spits out the velocities and do it with, with re reinforcement learning, or in this case, with behavioral cloning and kind of learn that policy. So then at test time, you can show a new demonstration. This will be mapped to a certain place in the embedding space. Now you can add this embedding to your, to your policy, and now you will have a policy that will be able to replicate this new demonstration. So the two losses that are being, that are being used here is um, first this, this embedding loss. This is the metric loss, which is trying to uh, minimize the differences of the demonstrations that are similar and be at least a margin away for the demonstrations that are dissimilar or, or that are demonstrations of different tasks. And in this case, they're using the dot product for the similarity, so the cosine metric. Uh, and then we use behavioral cloning, so just a supervised learning on our demonstrations to, uh, to learn the policies. And uh, what they were able to show is, is quite interesting. So um, they did some uh, simulated training, the training in simulation using domain randomization, where they kind of changed the, the texture of the background all the time. And then by showing just a single demonstration of where the object has to be hovered upon, I think, or it has to drop this ball to the, to the right ball. Um, if you provide a demonstration like this, the robot is able to replicate it even if you uh, change the configuration of the, of the setup in the, in the demo. So basically, this is one way of, of also finding a little bit more structure and finding this embedding space that can en encapsulate the demonstrations and find the similarities between different demonstrations so that you can do one-shot imitation learning. Um, and here's another case study that I, I wanted to bring up, which I think is also very interesting. Um, this is a paper from uh, Zhu Wang from DeepMind. Um, it's called Robust Imitation of Diverse Behaviors. And here, the idea is somewhat similar. Uh, so here, they would, they would be training a trajectory uh, variational autoencoder um, with two decoders, with one decoder that is responsible for um, that is conditioned on the state and produces an action, and the other that is just an autoregressive state decoder. In particular, the architecture looks like this. So they have a bidirectional LSTM to decode the demonstration, and this is being mapped to our latent Z. And then there are two decoders, one um, that kind of is similar to a policy, and the other one, which is a state decoder. And this is all trained using just the VAE objective. So we have the, uh, we are trying to maximize the log likelihood, but also we have this um, constraint on the KL. Um, initially, they trained this uh, just like that with the VAE objective, but then I think eventually they used the GAL setup to make these policies a little bit more robust. Um, but what's particularly interesting about this paper is that they're also learning this, this embedding space Z. And they're able to show that you can learn a little bit of, of you, can, you can interpret this embedding space that you're learning quite well. So in this case, they were training all kinds of different policies for a walker. And they were able to, to find some clusters in this embedding space where the behaviors were really similar to each other. And they were also able to show that you can interpolate between some of these behaviors. So uh, the way this plot works is that here we have a few shots, a few screenshots from the policy. So this is our policy over time, like one rollout. And this is policy number one. This is policy number two. So these are two points in this embedding space. And here you can, you can see all kinds of different interpolations. So if you interpolate in this embedding space, you can see that the policy also interpolates. So here we start from a certain position and we go to the, um, to the left, versus here we go to the right. And here you kind of see all kinds of different um, examples of, of going in between, somewhere in between. All right, so um, just to summarize this part, um, traditional learning from demonstration approaches focus more on learning from one particular demonstration, or for many demonstrations of one particular tasks. Um, here we were able to show that you're also learn from 
um, these unstructured and unlabeled demonstrations by first doing segmentation and then learning a deep neural network policy that is able to replicate each one of, of the segmented demonstrations. Uh, there are still a lot of challenges in this work. Um, you can see that the demos and, and so on, these are usually done in very small problems. So first, you know, we need to we need to scale this up, but also um, there are problems just um, that are similar to the problems that we experience with GANs, such as the mode collapse. So it's difficult to discover all kinds of different skills. Um, just the problem of, of discovering different policies from one continuous demonstration is a difficult problem. And then there's also a lot of questions on doing this from video demonstrations or from demonstration from a third person view and so on. Uh, yeah, so for the variational autoencoder training, yeah, I believe that they have a set of demonstrations of all kinds of different policies. This is not random behavior. Yeah. Um, right. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about learning from prior experiences. Um, so, again, I would like to motivate it a little bit. Um, so I would like to start with motor skill acquisition and how this is done in, in other living organisms. Um, so in particular, there's this one theory in psychology and philosophy called constructivism, um, which talks about the way that, uh, that's also a theory that is widely applied in, in teaching, for example, uh, that says a lot about the way we, we teach each other. It's um, apparently it's much more effective to teach in a way where you don't start something from scratch, you don't start just explaining a novel concept, but uh, rather you start from something that we already know how to do, and then you just show how we can adapt that and how we should change that to to get to this new behavior or to this to this new concept that we are trying to learn. And um, apparently there's also some evidence in biology that this might be the case in terms of what's going on in. In, in living organisms. So there's been some research done on, on frogs um, where uh, they were able to show that um, the way that the spinal cord of a frog controls the frog's movement is through um, sending very simple signals uh, and modulating a little grammar of basic behaviors. And from that we can kind of gain this, this whole rich family of all kinds of different complex behaviors. So it seems that there is just a, a small number of very basic skills and then the spinal cord is just firing them differently. And because of that, we can, we can arrive at this rich family of all kinds of different things that frogs can do. Um, there's also one more evidence coming from robotics. Um, this is often referred to as hand synergies. So um, this is um, the work on in-hand manipulation, so all kinds of different things you can do with your, with your hand, like reorienting the objects and things like that. So um, there's lots of data sets of, of humans doing these kind of things, or robots and anthropomorphic hands doing these kind of, these kind of um, skills. And if you take a data set like this, and you do some um, data, the, the dimensionality reduction techniques on it, such as principal component analysis, you can show that if you take only a few major factors, a few major components, these cover a huge majority of the skills. So what that seems to indicate is that for all these different things, all these crazy things we can do with our hands, there's only a few basic behaviors that we need to really nail down to be able to, to show all kinds of things. So there is some underlying structure in all of these different skills. And then there's also a theory in psychology, uh, which is uh, referred to as positive, positive transfer, where um, there are certain motions that we can do that transfer really well to things that seemingly think, seem very, very different. So one particular example that I found amusing was uh, if you're good at leading to a cricket ball, uh, maybe this is not a, a good example that should be brought up in Poland. We don't really do a lot of cricket here. But um, if you're really good at that, at throwing a ball at cricket, apparently it transfers really well to, to being able to do a cartwheel. So it seems that there is some underlying thing that um, if we can do it, then it will transfer to also other, other skills. So let's compare it again to the world of robotics. Um, so here, the way we acquire skill 
is usually through model-free reinforcement learning. So again, we can bring up the example of, of Google Brain and having these seven robots collecting experiences over long periods of time, using a lot of compute and learning this one particular skill, in this case, the skill of grasping. And you know, it's really impressive that we can learn this kind of skill purely from vision, and we can achieve you know, really high accuracy and basically solve it. Um, but it's still a little bit unsatisfying in, in terms of we have that skill, but we, if we wanted to, to train something on top of it, so for example, do stacking now or all kinds of different manipulation skills, it's not really clear how to do that. And in particular, there's this example that I found from a reinforcement learning paper where um, the, the authors were presenting um, some new deep reinforcement learning method and they were evaluating it on a set of tasks. And one task they were evaluating it on was um, lifting an object. And this is the reinforcement learning curve that uh, looks kind of standard. So we start from, so this is reward, this is the number of episodes. We start from zero reward, so we basically don't know how to do anything. And then over time we get better and better until we learn how to lift an object. But then they also showed another result, which is learning how to stack two objects. And you know, the curve looks somewhat similar. Um, it still goes up with the number of episodes. Eventually they're able to learn how to do it. But the, the, the really bothering fact to me here is that we start from scratch again, even though we just learn how to lift, which is clearly a, a sub-skill of, of learning how to stack. Um, so the way we, we train things in model-free reinforcement learning world right now is that um, it's not very clear how we can reuse the skills. So one thing that we would like to focus on is how we can discover some structure while we are learning these skills, such that we can easily reuse them later and interpolate between them and mix and match them however we like so that we can um, learn these skills or adapt these skills at test time very quickly. Okay, and when we talk about um, trying to learn structure in data, um, one field that we should, we should get inspiration from is the field of generative modeling. So in particular, there's been a lot of really amazing progress in this field. This is um, one example of, of GANs uh, presented by NVIDIA researchers. Um, showing all kinds of um, synthetic faces that were, so these are not faces of real people, I believe, um, and how they, you can smoothly interpolate between different faces by interpolating in the latent space of this data. So basically, they were able to discover this latent structure, but they discover it such that if you interpolate in that latent structure, you also smoothly interpolate um, the images, so you kind of can, can blend from one image to another. And there's also similar examples in language. So there's this thing called uh, word embeddings, where we can learn embeddings such that they can also maintain the relationships between the words. So for example, the difference between the embeddings of the words woman and a man is similar to the difference between the embeddings of the words aunt and uncle, or queen and king. And um, to some extent, we can even do arithmetic operations on these embeddings, on these latent representations. So we can take an Im uh, images of men with glasses, subtract a man, add a woman, and generate images of women with glasses. So it seems that they were able to discover a quite rich structure in this data, and also discover it such that we can manipulate the structure and kind of do all kinds of different things. So let's see if we can do something similar for robotics and deep RL. So let's try to do it naively. So let's look at how latent space in images works. So we have images of two celebrities, I, I guess. Um, we have one image and another image. We will map both of these to some points in the embedding space that we are learning. And one other property that we would like is that if you interpolate between these two points, you will be also interpolating in the image space. So it will be the smooth interpolation between um, two different images. So one way how we could apply it to policies is basically take a policy of one particular skill, embed it to some point in the embedding space, so kind of squish it over time, project it into a point in the embedding space, take another policy that does something different, also squish it, um, embed it to a point in the learned embedding space, and then we hope that we'll also get this interpolation property where we can kind of pick any point between these two points in the embedding space and kind of get the skill that is in between the two. And when we have that, the hope is that now that we have this rich embedding space that kind of shows the, the library of all kinds of different things we can do, we can use that to learn more complex skills on top of that. 
Um, all right, so the main idea, again, is to um, learn multiple reusable skills and to represent them in the skill embedding. So uh, I've been talking quite a bit about embedding, so um, this is a picture of what I have in mind when, when I talk about this. So let's imagine abstract embedding space. And I would like this embedding space to be formed such that it can be split into different regions, different areas, and um, let's depict them with geometric shapes. So we have, you know, let's say, squares, triangles, circles, polygons, all kinds of things. And um, each region is responsible for one particular skill. So for example, squares will be responsible for grasping, triangles for stacking, and so on. So not only this, but we also would like to train it such that if we take different samples from one particular region, so for example from polygons, these samples should correspond to different solutions of that particular task. So for example, in case of grasping, one sample could lead to a top grasp, and another sample could lead to a side grasp. So to show a more concrete example, if polygons was the task to push this little block that is attached on the rail to the middle of the workspace, maybe one sample could lead to the solution where the robot simply cages the object and pushes it towards the middle, versus another solution could, look could work a little differently where the robot doesn't cage the object but instead pokes it with its knuckles and eventually gets it there. And yet another solution could be even different where the robot squishes the object from the top and then pokes it once with its elbow and it gets to the solution. And the reason why we want to do this is so that we have this rich library of skills and different ways of accomplishing these skills so that we can then borrow from this library at test time and kind of learn new skills on top of that. Right? So that's the idea. So we would like to first train this embedding space, and then once we have that embedding space, um, use that embedding space to transfer to a new setup. Right, so to repeat the question, how is that different from the paper in the previous session, one of the ca uh, case studies that was talking about imitation learning? So the main difference is that this is reinforcement learning, not imitation learning, so we don't have any demonstrations whatsoever. Um, and that brings all kinds of different challenges. And also the, the derivation and the setup is, is quite different, so we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we want to learn this embedding space. Um, the main question in, in all of these deep learning methods is how do we train this? Um, so let's start with a, with a simple schema showing how reinforcement learning works. So we have some observations, then we try to learn a policy that given a state, given an observation will produce an action, and then we act uh, in the environment to collect the data and, and kind of learn this policy. Uh, so now what we would do is we will start um, by saying that we are in this multitask reinforcement learning setup, so we are solving multiple tasks at the same time. Um, and we also assume that we know which task we are currently solving. So for example, we could have a one hot vector, um, this task ID, that tells us which task we are currently trying to solve. Then we'll try to learn a mapping from this task ID vector to an embedding space. So this is a stochastic space. So this could be, for example, a conditional Gaussian. Um, and we'll learn this mapping. So this is the embedding space that I've been talking about this whole time. Um, we learn this mapping. We have the stochastic embedding space. And uh, now we can sample from this space and condition our policy on that sample. So this is somewhat similar to this intention stuff. But now we have this embedding that we are also learning on top of that. And this is RL. All right, so now we have this policy that is conditioned on the sample from the embedding. We keep the sample constant over the course of the trajectory. And now we also introduce the regularizer, which kind of comes from variational inference. Um, I encourage you to look at the derivation in the paper, um, where this is kind of similar to this intention network, where uh, we call it the inference network, where now we look at the short trajectory snippet of state and actions, and then we try to regress it towards the embedding that was set initially. Right? So basically a similar idea where we have a supervised learning problem here and we try, our, we, we try to encourage our RL agent to help us with that problem. So what that encourages the agent to do, this is a regularization technique, is it will encourage it to really pay attention to all kinds of different Zs, to even different samples from the same Gaussian, so that every, every sample would lead to a slightly different solution. So this is what allows us to get this diverse, the, the emergence of very diverse behaviors. Right? So this is very important so that we have this rich library of skills. Right, so we, we train with all of this. We, we, at the end, we get our embedding space. So now how can we use it? 
So let's switch to test time. So in this case, we can get rid of all the things that we don't really need anymore. So we don't need this regularizer. We also don't know which task we're in. So we just we can get rid of this network. Now we'll freeze the connection, so all the policies that we learned before. And the only thing we'll be learning is a mapping from observations to these embedding vectors. right? And we can do it through reinforcement learning. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we are trying to learn a new skill by only allowing the agent to reusing the skills that it already knows how to do. Except we are doing this in this embedding space, so we have this plastic space where we represented all kinds of different skills we learned so far. And now we just allow the agent to say, your actions, or we, we tell the agent that your actions are the vectors in this embedding space. So you know, max and match whatever you learned so far to, to learn a new skill. Right, so that's the idea. And so another way of, of thinking about this is that now we are not doing exploration at the granular action level, but rather on a skill level. All right, so um, this is how we, how we train this entire thing. Um, this comes from uh, interpreting reinforcement learning as variational inference. There's quite a lot of work on, on this topic in the recent half a year or so. And um, in particular, we are adding two additional objectives to our RL agent. One is to maximize the entropy of this embedding. So basically, we want to, what that means is that we want our Gaussians to be big. So we want this embedding space to be very densely populated. So we want to cover as much space in the embedding as possible, so it's easily searchable. And the other objective is to minimize the cross entropy between these two. So basically, we want our inference network to do a good job in predicting what embedding the skill came from. And these two, these two objectives seem kind of arbitrary. But um, in the paper, we show that they actually come from, if you have, our, if you have the um, entropy regularized RL objective, and you do variational lower bound, a slightly different one, on the entropy term, you can show that these two correspond to exactly two terms that you get out of this plus the entropy of the policy. All right, so, so this is the, the basic framework. Um, it comes from using variational inference together with, with reinforcement learning. And um, now I'd like to show a little bit the applications of it. So the, the main application is multitask learning, which I'll spend most time on. And then if we still have time, I'll, I'll try to show some, some other things that um, us and also other people have done with it. Right, so in terms of multitask learning, with, well, let's start with a simple robotic example. So the way I'll be showing this result is as follows. In the top row, I'll be showing the, the skills that we use to pre-train the embedding. So this is kind of this first step where we just try to learn the embedding. And at the bottom, in the bottom row, I'll be showing um, the skill that, we, that was trained by reusing these embeddings. So this is kind of our test setup where we are just finding the mapping from states to the embedding vectors. Right, so the, the simple setup is the interpolation. Oh, sorry, so just to repeat what I just said. So the, the top row is um, how we learn the embedding, and the bottom row is this learning the new skill by reusing the embedding. All right, so the first skill is the interpolation skill, where one, thing, one skill that we're trying to learn is to pull on this block that is attached on a string, so the robot has to hold on to it. Otherwise, it, if it lets go, then the, the block will just snap back. So you can see that the policy that it learns, the, the robot holds onto it the entire time, and it needs to bring it to the middle of the workspace, to so this little sphere. And the other task is to push this block around this red wall, and the block is not attached on the string, so the robot can let go of it at the end of the episode. And from these two, the interpolation is very clear, so we can just have the block that is, there's still a wall, but the block is attached on the string, and the robot has to hold on to it and push it around the, around the wall, and you can see this, this kind of round trajectory here, and then hold on to it so that it gets the full reward. And this is trained by reusing the previous skill. So when we look at this, it actually looks like the, the embedding that it was being used is the embedding some, somewhat between these two. So this is a simple interpolation skill. Let's, let's see if we can do something more interesting. So in this case, again, the top row are the two skills that we use to train the embedding on, and the bottom row is where we transfer. So the first skill is, um, push the block in the middle of the white container. That's it. And the second skill is just to lift the block up. And you can do it however you want. So in this case, most of the, most of the times, the robot would push it against the, the edge of the white, con white container and then scoop it up. Um, right, so we trained the embedding on these two. And now we are trying to transfer. Um, 
Here, one skill that we transfer to is this, um, the task of pushing the block in the middle of the workspace, but now you have this L-shaped wall that you've never seen before. So now you have to, from the previously learned skills, you have to figure out an embedding that kind of corresponds to pushing the block along the edges of the white container so that you can avoid this wall and get it there. And also, if you use different embeddings, you can find another solution where you push along the, the other side of the wall. Now, we can also use exact same embeddings and train a different task. And we can do it efficiently, where now there's a wall that goes across the entire, um, entire container, and now the robot pushes the block uh, against the edge of the white container and kind of slides it down to get to the middle of the container. So this left us a little bit puzzled because in these skills, we don't really see any behavior, or we didn't request the robot to learn any behavior where it, it learns how to push the block along the edges of the object. The only way it's required, the, the only skill that is required to learn is how to push it to, towards the middle. So we, we went on and visualized a little bit more what's going on. So in particular, this is an image that shows trajectories of the block for the lifting task in two different cases. Um, so one case is when we have the full setup of the inference network that acts as a regularizer to have these diverse skills. And the other setup here in, in black is where we don't have this inference network. So, uh, and and the, the little circle, this corresponds to the event of the box being lifted up. So if we don't introduce the inference network, if we don't have this um, regularizer, then every single uh, way that you learn how to lift this block is by pushing it against this top edge of the white container and then scooping it up. However, if we introduce the inference network, we learn all kinds of different ways of doing it. So you can push it you know, in different directions. You can lift it from the middle of the container or push it against the, against the edge. So you kind of learn this much richer library of how you can do this. And the richer the library is, the easier it is to find in this library the, the skill that you actually want to transfer to a new setup. So this is the reason why we are able to, to transfer to these skills that are not super similar to what we trained them on. Right, so let's see one more example of sequencing these two. So again, first skill to train the embedding on is to uh, pull on the block and get it to a certain height. And another skill starts when the block is on the table and you have to push it towards the middle of the table. Now, the important caveat here is that here there is nothing that, that is in our way. So basically, the workspace is free, and you can just go with your arm through the workspace, grab the block, and lift it. So now we try to sequence these two skills. So the task is to first lift the block up, and then once you're on the height of the table, push it towards the middle. The important part here is that we have this table now in the middle. So in order to lift the block, you have to find in your embedding space a solution that you know, brings the arm in this little awkward position to get to this block and then lift it. If you only learned one way of, of lifting the block, then the only way you know how to do it is by going through the, through the middle of the workspace, which wouldn't work in that case. All right, so, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, what kind of simulator are we using? Uh, we're using Mujoko. Uh, in particular, uh, this was done at DeepMind uh, using DM Control Suite or uh, DM Manipulation Suite, which I believe will be, I don't know, <laughs> don't want to say too much. <laughs> um, all right, so um, uh, we can look at some quantitative analysis. Um, so we'll be comparing these tests that I've showed to three different baselines. One baseline is when we don't have the inference network, so basically the, the skills that we're learning are not as diverse. The other one is we are just trying to learn this new skill from scratch. And one other one is when rather than learning the mapping through these embeddings, we can just learn the mapping directly to these task IDs. So this is a very simplified setup. So first we start with the spring wall task. So this is a simple task where you had to pull on the block. Um, you can see that our method performs um, quite well. It is able to solve the task. But it seems that the presence of the inference network is not that important. You can still solve this task even if you don't build this rich library of skills. If we look at the L wall setup, the difference is much more apparent. So our method is the only method that is able to solve this task fully. And um, when you try to s solve it from scratch, you also don't succeed. And it seems that the inference network here, the presence of the inference network is much more important. And in terms of this last task, where you had to push it on, uh, or get it on the table and then push it in the middle of the table, 
Um, our, t our solution is the only one that is able to solve this task, um, and we compare to all kinds of different agents that we could find in the DeepMind library. So these are state-of-the-art RL agents. Um, so in all three of these cases, we are trying to pre-train this embedding space on tasks that seem relevant to the task that we wanted to transfer to. Um, so one experiment that we wanted to do is to see you know, if we can scale this up. So one thing that we've tried, which is very simple, is let's just pre-train the embedding space and all the different skills that we use to pre-train these, these three examples. So in this case, we'll have three different policies that we will pre-train the embedding on and then try to evaluate them on each one of these tasks. So this is the curve in purple here. So we can see that it still is able to solve all of these tasks. Now the embedding space is much richer because we have the solutions of all kinds of different tasks, so all, of all six of them rather than just two. So it takes a little bit long to find a solution in this embedding space. So the curve doesn't go as abruptly as in, in the previous case, but we can still find solution to all of these tasks. So, so one thing that I'm particularly really interested in is how much can we scale this up? So you can imagine that you could pre-train this embedding space on all kinds of simple manipulation skills, you know, grasping, reaching, stacking, all kinds of simple things that we know how to do, train it on, let's say, hundreds of them, learn this really rich embedding space, and now hopefully maybe you will be able to learn any manipulation skill you want by interpolating and sequencing these skills that you already learned how to do. Mm -hmm. And only those six are embedded in this uh, That's correct. What's the dimensionality of the space? Right. So just to repeat the question. Um, so um, the question was about the dimensionality of the embedding space. Um, in this case, I believe it was fairly small. I think just three dimensions. Um, this was just to visualize it better. But I think um, in terms of learning, I think it worked similarly on uh, at least in the range between 1 to 10, I think, or 3 to 10, it was similar. Uh, so even though this dimensionality is pretty small, the number of them is small, uh, it still takes some time for those embeddings to converge, right? Right, so to pre-train these embeddings, um, this is quite a time-consuming process, right? So um, to, you're in this multitask RL setup, you're trying to learn multiple tasks at the same time, and then on top of that, you're trying to learn the embedding. So this is not very data efficient. But the, the, the goal of this is rather to, to do all of that, to learn these skills, because you would have to do it anyway if you wanted to learn them, but then embed them such that if you want to learn a new task, you can do it much quicker. So basically, the, the, the complexity and the, the sample complexity, the, the, the one that we care about is the one in the test scenario, where you're trying to learn a new task by reusing the previous tasks. Mm -hmm. um, all right, great. So, so this is application to um, multitask learning. I wanted to briefly mention uh, one of our recent works on how you, how you can apply this to the sim to real setup. Um, so one thing you can do um, is you can start with our, with our initial variational inference reinforcement learning setup. Now you can train all of this embedding stuff. This is somewhat related to this question. You can train all of this embedding that is quite inefficient in simulation. So now you have, in your simulation, you train all kinds of different policies that are able to solve different tasks. And you know, it took some time, but you can run faster than real time, paralyze it on thousands of GPUs, and you, know, you can deal with that. Um, and now we try to transfer this to real world. So now this is where we really care about sample complexity. So in the real world, we'll just try to find the mapping from observations to this embedding space. One other caveat here is that you can train it with reinforcement learning, which is still a little bit inefficient, but you can also apply other methods here. So one other thing that we've tried here is uh, to use model predictive control. This is a, an algorithm coming from control theory. Um, which was much more efficient, and I'm happy to talk about the details offline. Um, so in particular, this is one experiment um, that I wanted to show you where we train in simulation a, a little Sawyer robot, so a little robotic arm that has to push the block up, down, left, and right. So these are these four different tasks, and it learns, it, um, in, it learns how to do it in a variety of ways using this task embeddings idea. So we train all, we pre-train all of this in simulation. We, train, we have this embedding space, and now we try to transfer this in the real world where we really care about the sample complexity. So here we, we have this little block, 
And in this case, our task is not only to transfer it from sim, but also to push it towards the top left corner. So this is kind of a combination of two tasks. And in this case, you maybe you know your simulator is not perfect, so you can't just take any policy that you learned and kind of transfer it on the real robot. But because you learned such a rich library of them, you have so such a diverse set of these policies, then maybe some of them transfer. So then it is able to find the policies that do transfer and then compose the behavior out of them that is able to, to accomplish the task much more efficiently. Right, so I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, I wanted to show some other application of how you can use it for domain randomization. Um, but then there's also an application um, that also comes from uh, Google Brain. This is not my work, this is work from Ben Eisenbach of how you can apply these ideas to reward free learning. So in all of these cases, we, we need a reward function, and this is one of the big problems in, in reinforcement learning. You know, where, where do the rewards come from? How do we know how to accomplish the task? And you know, one way of doing it is to just specify a sparse reward, so you only get a reward if you accomplish the task fully, but very often it's very tricky, so people add all kinds of reward shaping terms, and these are also tricky to, to get in the real world. So here's one other idea what you can do. So what if we didn't have any rewards, and instead, we use this task embedding framework to just say, learn all kinds of different ways of doing stuff in the world. Right? So we only get a reward if you can learn a skill that you have never seen before. Right? So um, the setting is actually very similar to the, to the board that I just described, except we now don't have these task IDs. We just sample directly from the prior distribution. Um, and our discriminator, which in the previous case was this inference network, is only conditioned on the current state, and we only get the reward um, through that, so we don't get any reward from the task. And it turns out that on simple domains, you can, if you just allow the agent to learn all kinds of different things and you don't specify any rewards, some of them seem kind of useful. So if you do cheetah, for example, you learn a little bit how to run forwards. It looks a little stupid, but you know, it somewhat works. You can learn how to run. Sometimes you can even learn how to do a backflip um, or how to go backwards. Um, so basically, if you just allow the agent to explore and you just require the agent to learn all kinds of different things that it can do in the environment, um, then maybe some of them will be useful. And then you can compose these skills together and learn something that makes sense at the end. Right, so to summarize this part, um, we are able to show that we can learn a skill embedding space that can be used for better exploration in a hierarchical RL. Um, this is a method that uses multitask reinforcement learning and um, learns skills that are easily reusable. And we can learn skills that are very versatile. So we learn this diverse set of them. There are still a lot of challenges here. Um, and I think one really big challenge, the, the main bottleneck of this approach, is the multitask RL framework itself. So usually, in my experience, it's not hard to learn this embedding space. What's hard is to train one policy that is able to solve all kinds of different tasks. Um, there's also questions uh, regarding the continual kind of lifelong learning setup. So how can you learn these embeddings such that once you learn them, if you want to add another skill to this embedding, how can you do that? Right? And how can you do this efficiently so you don't destroy what you already know? And then how can you learn them such that you can be much more efficient when training on this new task, on the downstream task? All right, so um, in this talk, I've been trying to show you some examples of, of um, how we can use multitask um, deep robotic learning in imitation learning and in learning from prior experiences. There's still a lot of challenges that are left. Um, I mentioned some of them for imitation as well as for experience. Um, there is many other really interesting works that um, are quite recent. I, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides afterwards so you guys can, can look them up. Uh, that, that talk about using ideas from variational inference and how to combine it with reinforcement learning and how to take advantage of structure that we see when we do reinforcement learning. And uh, I would like to learn all of my collaborators without whom this work wouldn't have been possible, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>